Hey everybody, how are you? I wanted to put together a video sharing with you our plans for this week and also providing the audio for our next story that we're going to read. So I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. This might be a little choppy because I'm gonna be going back and forth between a couple different screens here. So hopefully um, you saw the broom dog activity plans. I want to start by letting you know that this does not come into your schedule until you are finished with the independent reading assessment. That needs to be done first. Um, I've given you guys an extra week to work on that just in case um, your book was longer and you just started the book. Uh, many of you emailed me and explained that you were not at you know the, the climax of the story yet or the falling action and i completely understand and respect you for letting me know that so i've decided to give you guys an extra week to get that done and knowing that i gave you guys an extra week i would hope that you guys do an amazing job when you guys turn that in i'm super excited to see some of the books that you guys are reading during this quarantine um, and I'm excited for you to share with me those books because it'll just give me more books to read during these you know, next couple weeks that we are stuck at home and not together. Um, so this broom dog activity is for you know, those that are done. As soon as you submit that independent reading, please jump in here and start working on this. Um, there isn't an actual due date. This is just for you to kind of, you know, work through and enjoy. It's an amazing story um, about a boy who has a, a major fear and he overcomes that fear. And it's about, you know, the people that are in his life that support him to get through this fear. So it's an awesome story. So I really do hope that you all have a chance to enjoy it. Um, even if the independent reading project takes you until, you know, Wednesday and all you have time to do is just listen to this and read the broom dog story, then that's fine at least you've been able to read it and enjoy it. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and just kind of explain and then I will go ahead into the audio for you. So here is your plan. You are going to, um, if you're getting this from Google Classroom, which is where I shared it to you, then it automatically makes the copy for you. Um, you're gonna open up the story. You are going to read and you're gonna annotate Canton's fears and how he overcomes them. So that's this top part here. Then the bottom part, is where he he talks about metaphors. There's a lot of metaphors in this story um, for a school bus. And you're going to put some of them down and explain what they mean. And then the bottom of this is basically, um, you're gonna write a paragraph about who is your support. Like who supports you when you're you know challenged with something or you're afraid of something. You're gonna wanna describe it and tell me about it and how it helps you overcome your fear or your sadness, okay? And feel free to drop a picture in there too because I would love to see it. So this is just kind of your overall plan. Um, there's also a quiz in here that you're gonna take at the end. You guys know scope. We, you know, we read it, we work on vocabulary, we do some activities, and then we take a quiz. So it's just a comprehension check. If you do it, great, and you know, you do well on it, then your points are gonna show up in Power School. If you do not get to this because of your independent reading project, then it's going to get exempt. So don't worry about it, please. Nothing to stress you out, just another activity for you to enjoy, okay? So when you click on this broom dog here, we will bring, it will bring you to the reading, which is over here. So let me move that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start reading it. It is available for you to listen to if you log into Scope, but if you don't remember what your Scope username and password is, then just listen to this. So here we go. We will read, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. Um, yes, I'm sure you're noticing right now it's 12 pages, yes it is, but it's so good. Okay, so here we go. A school bus is many things. A school bus is a substitute for a limousine. A school bus is the student's version of a teacher's lounge. A school bus is the principal's desk. A school bus is the nurse's cot. A school bus is an office with all the phones ringing. So hopefully, um, just with that paragraph, you're able to make some connections to a school bus. And you might agree with some of this, you might disagree, depending on your own personal experiences and your background knowledge. Um, one thing I can confirm is that yes, a school bus is 
like a substitute for a limousine. It is um, not as glamorous as a limousine, but it definitely commutes riders, students back and forth to school and to their home. So I would agree with that right there. Um, let's go ahead and move into paragraph two. A school bus is a safe zone. A school bus is a war zone. A school bus is a concert hall. A school bus is a food court. A school bus is a court of law, all judges, all jury. A school bus is a magic show full of disappearing acts. A school bus is a bumblebee buzzing around with a bunch of stingers on the inside of it. When I read this, um, where it says it's a safe zone, it's a war zone, a concert hall, I have a couple connections in my mind. I think about how some students don't enjoy being on a school bus because they maybe get um, you know, bullied or harassed. Um, some people feel very safe on a school bus, but some people don't. So it just depends on your own personal experiences. It also talks about um, how it's a concert hall. When we are on field trips with you and we're riding in that school bus, I 100% agree it is like a concert hall. We have students singing songs that I've never even heard of before. All right, paragraph three. A school bus is a book of stamps, passing mail through windows, notes in the form of cappy candy wrappers telling the streets something sweet came by, notes in the form of fingers pointing at the world zooming by. A school bus is a ketchup packet with a tiny hole in it left on a seat, a paper tube around a straw. That straw will puncture the lid on things, make the world drink something with some fizz and fight. Something delightful and uncomfortable, something that will stain and cause gas. A school bus is a talent show. A school bus is a microphone, a beat machine, a recording booth. A school bus is a horn section, a rhythm section, an orchestra pit. So this paragraph five here, it gives us a lot of details about the noise that is involved in a school bus. And I'm sure that many of you can relate to that. And you probably think, you know, sometimes you might dread getting in the school bus on the way home because of how loud it's going to be. Or sometimes even in the morning, you might still be really tired and then you get on the bus and you have all this noise going on and it's kind of overwhelming first thing in the morning. And it could sound like a horn section super loud. All right. A school bus is a basketball court, a football stadium, a soccer field. A school bus is a movie set. Actors, directors, producers, script, scenes, settings, motivations, action, cut. Your fake tears look real. These are real tears, but I thought you were making a comedy. A school bus is a misunderstanding. So um, as you can see in here, they go through a bunch of different scenarios that are kind of talked about on a school bus. Some people might talk, you know, sports. Some people might talk, you know, movies. Um, some people might act like they're being, you know, real. And some people might act like they're kind of fake. Um, a school bus is a misunderstanding. Sometimes I think everybody has their own perception of a school bus. And yes, it is a misunderstanding. Each bus is different, which leads people to believe different things. Um, you have your own personal connections to what that school bus is. And that's your understanding of what a bus is, which isn't always the same for everybody. So right here, we have a metaphor where they, um, the author says a school bus is a must understanding. Another metaphor up here, a school bus is a horn section. So that kind of paints a picture in our mind about a school bus. Paragraph seven, to Canton, a school bus is also a cannonball, a thing that almost destroyed him, almost made him motherless. So another metaphor, he just described a school bus as a cannonball, which we know if a cannonball goes off, it's going to destroy or explode whatever it's in his path. Um, so that is a big misunderstanding because I don't think there's a lot of people out there that would make that kind of a metaphor describing a school bus. So that kind of sets our stage right now for what we're gonna get into. I'm hoping that in my question of what happened to Canton's mother, that would cause him to think that the school bus is a cannonball and that almost let him, you know, made him motherless. So paragraph eight, Canton's mother is the crossing guard at Latimer Middle School and has been the crossing guard there since before he was born. 
He grew up running around the house wearing her neon vest, blowing her whistle. He learned to say stop before he learned to say potty, hand up to halt, then hand out for the wave through. To Canton, crossing guards, especially his mother, seemed to have special powers. They were able to stop moving things, able to slow traffic, able to make a safe way for people to cross from one side to another. Their vests were capes and their whistles blew some kind of magic tone that forced drivers to hit brakes. So from reading those last two paragraphs, eight and nine, we kind of get the vision that Canton thinks that crossing guards and his mother have superpowers. They're kind of like superheroes. They're able to stop buses to a halt just by putting up their hand and wearing their vest or their capes. So he looks up to those crossing guards and his mom a great deal. In fact, when he was young, he would pretend that he was his mom by wearing that cape and putting his hand up and doing, you know, the wave to get the cars to go by. Whoops. Chapter or paragraph 10. That's what Canton always thought until a year ago when a little blue ball went bouncing off the sidewalk into the street and a boy named Kenzie Thompson went running after it. Canton's mom had turned her back just for a moment, a split second. And by the time she realized what was happening, Kenzie was charging across the crosswalk, a school bus headed right toward him. There wasn't enough time to blow the whistle, so Canton's mother, Miss Potts Post, went chasing after Kenzie, who, once he realized the bus was coming, froze in the middle of Portal Avenue. The bus hit the brakes. The scream of metal and smoke kicking up from the burning rubber filled the air as Miss Potts threw her entire body into Kenzie, knocking him forward. The bus turned just enough to avoid hitting Kenzie, but not enough to avoid slightly bumping her. But a slight bump from a bus isn't so slight. But a broken shoulder and a bruised hip is much better than a burial. But the whole thing was devastating to Canton. So we kind of get an idea why he referred to the school bus as a cannonball. Um, Miss Post, Canton's mother, went out into the crosswalk to save Kenzie, who was running after his ball. And um, though the school bus tried to stop, it still ended up, you know, hitting her in the shoulder to the point where he, she, you know, broke shoulder, broke her shoulder and had a bruised hip. So um, in this part here where it says um, it's much better than a burial, meaning that this is much better, that broken shoulder and a bruised hip is much better than having to bury, you know, his mother. All right, chapter 13, or paragraph 13, sorry. Canton always waited for his mother after school, killing time by helping Mr. Munch, the custodian, do custodial things. Actually, mostly Canton just saw around listening to Mr. Munch complain about things like the bathrooms. But on the day Canton's mother was hit by a bus, the conversation about why kids throw pennies on the floor like pennies don't spend, spend was cut short by James, Jasmine, Jordan, and Terrence Jumper, who came running back into the school screaming it, screaming about it. Miss Post got hit by a school bus, a sentence Canton never expected to hear. And hearing it was like hearing the words longest whistle blow, shrill, shredding his eardrums. His skin was crawling, felt like it was changing color from brown to yellow school bus color. By the time Canton and Mr. Munch got outside, sirens were already blaring down Portal Avenue. So here um, they use another metaphor. It says, and hearing it was like hearing the world's longest whistle blow, shrill shredding his eardrums. His skin was crawling, felt like it was changing color from brown to yellow, school bus yellow. So actually in here, it's not really a metaphor, it's more of a simile. It says in hearing it was like hearing the world's longest whistle blow. Um, it also talked here, his skin was crawling. This is actually a form of personification because skin is not a real object and it was crawling, which is a human characteristic. So there we have a form of a personification, but through those two figurative languages, we really know how Canton is feeling about this. Okay, paragraph 15. Miss Post went back to work in a week. The whistle in mouth, vest 
strapped on, altered only by the sling holding her shoulder in place. She went back to normal. She had to, said it was just part of the job. So her reaction is pretty nonchalant. Like she knows she has to go back. She's not worried about it. Um, but I have a feeling that Canton's gonna feel differently. Paragraph 16, but not Canton. He didn't go back to normal. The afternoon, his mother returned to the corner to guide students across the street. Mr. Munch found Canton in the bathroom after school, sitting on the nasty tile floor in the corner, his head pressed against his knees. Canton, what are you doing in here? Mr. Munch asked. When Canton lifted his head up, Mr. Munch could see that he'd been crying. He could also see that Canton's chest was pumping, heaving like it was hard for him to breathe, like it would break open. Mr. Munch got down on the floor with him, squatted beside him, and talked him through some breathing exercises. So it doesn't say it right here, but knowing that he's, you know, it's hard for him to breathe, and, you know, that his chest, it was like it was going to break open, we can definitely infer that Canton is having a panic attack right now. Um, and I can assume, we can infer that it's because his mom is out there being, you know, going back to her job as a cross, crossing guard, and it has him very, very nervous. So Mr. Munch was there for him, you know, kind of got down to his level and kind of coaxed him through and helped him with some breathing exercises to kind of calm that panic attack down. All right, paragraph 20. Come on, Canton, count to 10 with me. One, two, three, and then now let's go back to one. 10, nine, eight. Eventually, Canton could breathe, could talk, could stand. Mr. Munch walked him outside. When they made it to the corner where Miss Post was working, Canton wrapped his arms around his mother and squeezed, held her so tight that she winced, her shoulders still a sack of, bo of broken bones. Okay, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, she chanted in his ear, trying to figure out how to get him to let go so she could do her job but not wanting to let go because he was also her job. So she's kind of torn. She knows she has to go back and, you know, be at the crossing guard and work, but she doesn't want to let go of Canton because her job is to support him also. All right, um, paragraph 22. Mr. Munch pant patted Canton on his shoulder, but realizing that there was no way this boy would let go of his mother, Mr. Munch decided that he would step into the street stick his fingers in his mouth and whistle. He put his hand up and yelled at the cars. I'm telling y'all right now, you hit me and I'm hitting you back. Once the traffic stopped, he yelled for all the waiting students to get on, cross the street. Then he turned back toward the stopped cars and puffed his chest, almost bucking, daring them to move. The next day, Mr. Munch met Canton outside his last class of the day, Mr. Devonzo's social studies class. How you feeling? I'm okay. Still got the jitters? Canton nodded, just slightly, trying to hide his embarrassment. Want to take a walk with me? I want to give you something. So right now we have Canton and Mr. Munch kind of building a relationship with one another. Mr. Canton knows that, or Mr. Munch knows that Canton is very emotional, very stressed out about his mom going back to the you know, crossing guard position. So he is going to try to help Canton out. All right, chair, paragraph 29. Canton and Mr. Munch soldered the halls of the school, pushing dust and hair that looked like dust and coins and candy wrappers and a random sock and drawstrings and loose braids and who knows what else as the students bustled away, eventually funneling through the doors inside the outside world. When my daughter, Winnie, went off to college, my wife got so nervous that she'd call Winnie multiple times a day. And whenever Winnie wouldn't answer, Zena would just, she'd lose it, Mr. Munch started. Zena's your wife? Yeah, Mr. Munch grinned. Best person I've ever known, but she's been through a lot, seen a lot of the world when she was young, and it made her terrified for our daughter, made her anxious, about every step Winnie took away from us. What if, what if something happens to her? What if she needs us? What if she's in danger? Zena would go on and on with these questions, up all night, sick with fear all day. So right here, Mr. Munch is trying to explain to Canton that he kind of 
understands where Canton is coming from and kind of understands some of the feelings that he's feeling right there because his wife has experienced, you know, being terrified and anxious about different situations. All right. Paragraph 33. And what do you say? Well, nothing. But what I did was I buy her a dog. A dog? Yep. They stopped at the custodian's closet. The old man pushed the pile of middle school debris into the corner, then pulled out a million keys, flipping through them like pages of a book. Not because she wanted something else to care for. No dog can take the place of our baby girl. But I read this thing about emotional support animals. What's that? Basically, it's like having a dog to make you feel better. Finally, he picked the right key and opened the closet door. I mean, what's better than a dog, right? They went into the closet, which was big enough to be an office. Pictures on the wall of Mr. Munch's wife and daughter and the dog, a small curly haired thing with an underbite. So ugly it was cute. At least Canton thought so. So now we're getting into the fact that an emotional support animal is what helped his wife. So we're going to see what he does for Canton. Um, okay, here we go. 42. But besides its cuteness, Canton kept thinking about all the things better than dogs, like ice cream and skateboards and maybe a girlfriend one day, or even a girl that's a friend and a good joke, or... Oh, and video games. Then after all that, dogs were cool. Mr. Munch, why are you telling me this? Canton asked. He was thinking maybe Mr. Munch was trying to be his emotional support dog, except not a dog. So now he's making the connection that Mr. Munch is trying to help him through his challenging time, trying to get him to overcome his fear of feeling anxious because his mom has to go out and be a, a crossing guard and do her job. Okay, so we're going to scroll down, 44, whoops, here we go. His emotional support human, and all this was just a way to keep his mind off of his mother and the fear of a school bus swiping her again. Why am I telling you this? He repeated Canton's question. Because I made you one. You, you made me a dog? Well, I couldn't just buy you a dog. Your mom might not be okay with that, but I thought maybe this would help. Mr. Munch reached into a locker and pulled out the head of a broom, the sweeping part, which he detached from the broomstick. The straw was curled and mangled as if Mr. Munch had been cleaning the sidewalk for like 20 years with it. He had drawn black, big black circles on one side with like eyes and an oval with a tic-tac-toe board in the middle of it, which Canton assumed was the mouth. At the top, were two pieces of cloth cut into ears and glued into place. It's a broom. I cleaned it, promise. And yeah, it's a broom until you do this. He petted the wiry twine as if it were fur, as if he were scratching behind the ear of a Yorkie in need of grooming. Why is the mouth like that? Is the broom dog angry? No, Mr. Munch turned the broom, head toward him, shrugged. He's smiling. Oh, Canton squished up his befuddled face. So you really think this is going to help me? Can't hurt to try. A slick smirk crept into Miss, onto Mr. Munch's face. I mean, the worst that could happen is you decide to clean up the street. So either way, everybody wins. So he uh, made him a, a broom dog, basically. Hopefully you were able to get a good visualization of what this dog looked like. At first he thought he was angry until he turned it and then he realized that he wasn't angry and he was more of a support dog. So paragraph 54, the next day after school, Canton with the broom dog tucked under his arm, slowly walked up to the corner to watch his mother, to guard the crossing guard. He leaned against the stop sign in the corner and whenever Mrs. Pot, Miss Potts had to step into the street, blow her whistle, raise her hand to stop traffic. Whenever Canton's chest would become an inflated balloon, he would run his fingers through the broom dog's hair. Eventually, he named it Daisy. It's strange, the things that work. So right here, it talks about whenever his Canton's chest would become an inflated balloon, okay? That was kind of how um, Mr. Munch described it earlier when he found him in the bathroom. 
this was like the onset of his anxiety attack. So whenever Canton was starting to feel this, he would just kind of pet the, the broom dog and it would kind of help him calm down. All right, paragraph 55. It's been a year since Mr. Munch gave Canton the broom dog, a year since the first panic attack, a year and a week since the accident and things have gotten better. The bell rings and everybody gets up to leave. Mr. Devonzo's class. Simon stands at the door, giving everyone high fives like he always does. Up high, he says to Canton as he approaches. Canton slaps his hand. Don't forget tonight's homework. Write about place, about people, human environmental interaction, Mr. Devonzo shouted over the end of day glam clamor, meaning commotion. 58. Canton stops at his locker, reaches in to grab Dusty, then heads to the door. He passes Mr. Wookley in the hallway, scolding Simon and Kenzie, the blue ball in his hand. Outside, he walks past Candace Green, who he never had the courage to talk to because she was always with her friends. Stinky Greg and cool Remy, he passed Mr. Johnson moving the carpool line along, had to get to the corner before the first cross. That was his thing for a year and a week. And when Canton finally made it up to the crosswalk at Portal Avenue, there was his mother, Miss Post, strapping on her vest and pulling the whistle attached to a black lanyard over her head like it was some kind of prestigious medal. So we have in here how Canton's kind of learned to adjust. Um, he grabs Dusty, which we can tell right now that Dusty is the um, is his support broom dog. And we also know um, that he wants to be there first. He wants to be the guard that's watching over the guard. So that is kind of part of his strategy to cope with this fear that he has of his mom getting hit is that he wants to be there first. Um, we also know down here where it says Mrs. Miss Post straps on her vest and pulls the whistle attached to the black lanyard over her head like it was some kind of a prestigious medal. She takes her job very, very seriously. She enjoys helping kids across the street in the crosswalk and making sure that they are safe. So that's something that she finds honor in. All right, here we go, 59. There's my sweet boy, she said, greeting him, arm winged. They hugged, how was school? It was okay, homework? Mr. Devonzo wants us to record human environmental interaction, which is, which is what I'm gonna work on. Canton made a funny face at his mom and she made one back. All right, 65. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I feel like I'm probably an expert at it. Canton chuckled. I'll let you know if I need your assistance. Deal, we'll get to it, Miss Post winked. Canton pulled a notebook from his backpack along with Dusty the broom dog, then set the bag down against the stop sign so that he could sit and have a little cushion. The broom dog rested on his lap as he scribbled words and phrases. Latimer Middle School, Corner, Portal Avenue, Avenue, Cars. Classmates, mom, whistle, people stop, people go, people talk, people hug, People frown, people laugh. People go off, people go on. Canton glanced up as everyone congregated at the corner, like water building against a dam, allowed to flow every few minutes. People turning and crossing, waiting and talking, the web of conversations. Gregory Pitts like Sandra White. Satchmo Jerkins feared he might be eaten by a dog on his way home. Cynthia Sauer was pulling on a show, putting on a show at 3.30, 3.33 p.m. Some banter on boogers and everyone wanted to know what secret thing Fatima Moss was always writing. So this part here in the beginning where it says that Canton glanced up as everyone congregated at the corner like water building against a dam allowed to flow every few minutes. If you can visualize that in your head, um, that's a very powerful statement. Right there, we know that his mom has a very important job because there are a lot of kids that are kind of piling in at that one part where they have to cross the street. And as soon as she lets them all go, it's like that water going through a dam. They're just running across that street to get themselves home. 
So that's a great form of visualization right there. All right, paragraph 70. He watched his classmates tap dance with tongues, challenging one another, slipping and sliding from story to story, watching his mother perform a kind of ballet. How she spun, stepped into the street like she was made of more, blew her whistle, put a hand up for a bus to stop, put her hand out to wave the walkers through. You can tell she's very happy if she's doing it like a dance, like ballet. She enjoys her job. 71. When all the Latimer students had walked off, headed home or wherever they went after school, Miss Potts removed her vest. She slung it over her shoulder, pulled the whistle over her head. Another day, job done. Ready to walk, she asked Canton, who had been working nonstop on his assignment. He nodded, yeah. Canton stood, the broom dock, broom dog falling from his lap like he had forgotten that it was there. Miss Post picked it up. Geez, this thing has seen better days, she examined. The mangled straw, the pieces of felt that were meant to be the ears long gone. I know it's supposed to be a dog, but now it kind of looks like a bus. She handed it to Canton. The eyes are like the headlights and that mean mouth. So now we have, um, Right here, I just want to point this out before I forget. It says, Canton stood, the broom dog fallen from his lap like he had forgotten that it was there. That sentence right there leads me to believe that Canton has overcome his fear. Um, he sits there and he hangs out with mom while she does her job and helps the kids cross the street. And he didn't, it's almost like he doesn't need that broom dog anymore. He doesn't need to be actually physically hanging on to, but just the support that it's there has helped him overcome his fear of his mom maybe getting hit again. So knowing that it says right here, he had forgotten that it was there. That there leads me to believe that inference that I just said. All right, so let's, let's start here um, at the bottom of, actually 76 is where we left off. Um, it's a smile, Canton corrected. Oh, right, the smile, it's the grill, funny. Canton had never noticed that. The broom dog had just become a thing he had, a thing he knew was there if he needed it. But it had been a long time, he realized, since he'd actually needed it. All right, 79. It's all faded now anyway, Canton said, grabbing his backpack. They stood on the corner, looked both ways before crossing. Still want it, his mother asked. Canton shrugged, tossed it up into the air, caught it, tossed it again, caught it again, and loose straw separated from the bunch again, and loose, and more loose straw falling down on them, and more. Miss Post laughed. Look at that, a school bus falling from the sky. Canton smiled. Knowing a school bus is many things. So is a walk home. All right, so hopefully you guys enjoyed that story and you were able to, you know, pick out some of that figurative language with, with me. There were similes, there were metaphors, there was personification. Um, there was also a lot of detail on how Canton overcame his fear of his mom being a, a crossing guard and helping students go across the street. So hopefully you enjoyed it and you're able to get, you know, the work done and work on that quiz. Please remember that we are here to help you. If you have any questions at all over any of this, please shoot us an email and we will be more than happy to email you back. Or if you need a separate Zoom and you want to talk about things, we are here for you. So have a great week. Hope you enjoyed it and we will talk to you guys soon. Bye.